Well, take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John. It's been 10 weeks since I've said those words, and I am excited to be back in the Gospel of John after being in the book of Proverbs for June and July. We began this study in John all the way back in January of this year, and we anticipate we'll be in the Gospel of John through December 2023. So we will be in this book of the Bible for a while. I'm preaching a message this morning I've entitled, Here comes the judge. As we've been going through the Gospel of John, some of you may have noticed that I've been dividing the Gospel of John into themes or sections. Each of these themes begins with the two words, Jesus is. And then in chapter 1, for instance, we saw that Jesus is here. Jesus is here. He's shown up. He's on the scene. He's arrived, and that's where we see, even in chapter 1, what's called the prologue of the Gospel of John, the first 18 verses which describe Jesus' arrival. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made. That has been made. You go down to verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh. He's here. And he dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is here. As we turn the page to chapter 3, we learn that Jesus is life. Jesus is life. He is the source of all life. And there we find the theme verse of that section, the very familiar verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Jesus is life, and he is the source of all life. And then as we turn to chapter 4, we began to see this truth that Jesus is God. And we saw this not just in what people said about Jesus, but we saw that Jesus was personally making pronouncements from his own lips that he is, in fact, God in human flesh. Well, I guess you could imagine This got all over people, got all over the religious leaders. And you may hear even today, skeptics say, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, Professor Smarty Pants, yes, he did. You obviously haven't read all four gospel accounts. You obviously haven't read the gospel of John, and especially John chapters 4 and 5, where Jesus makes some unequivocal claims to deity, that he is divine, that he is God. In fact, these claims were so clear That in verse 18 of John chapter 5, notice what John gives as commentary to the state of things. He says, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus' friends understood that Jesus claimed to be God, and Jesus' foes understood that Jesus claimed to be God. And now as we move to the paragraph we're going to study today, as we're back in the Gospel of John, we'll find yet again that Jesus begins to attribute to himself roles and responsibilities, prerogatives that can only be ascribed to God. Now, you may think that after some of the threats had come out, the religious leaders wanted to kill him, wanted to see him dead. His friends may have said, hey, Jesus, you may want to cool it a little bit on the God talk. You may want to kind of ease down and let those statements kind of simmer in the background, but he doesn't do that. He ramps it up. He elevates the God talk. Why? Because it's true. And Jesus is truth, and everything he says is true. He does not back off. He does not seek to mitigate. He does not try to explain anything away or soften the blow of his claims. No, just the opposite. He ramps it up and elevates it. I want you to keep in mind as we're about to read this passage that Jesus is speaking to these religious leaders, these Jewish leaders who had wanted to kill him. Some scholars even believe he was actually speaking before an official gathering of the Sanhedrin, the high theological and political court over Israel. So with your Bibles open, let's look at John chapter 5. We'll read our focal text, verses 25 through 30. This is the inspired inerrant word of God. The Bible says, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear 
will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own, but the will of him who sent me. Uh, Just a moment ago, I said something before I read the text that I often say or something similar. This is the inspired, inerrant word of God. And I would guess that most of you in this room would give mental and even verbal assent to that reality. We believe in the infallible nature of the Bible, that it is without error, that it is without falsehood, that it is true in all that it says. But I wonder if we really believe that. Do we really believe the Bible is true? And when I say true, it means fundamentally true. Most of you would give verbal and mental assent to this that, yes, it is inspired by God, is breathed out by God, 2 Timothy 3.16, that it's perfect, it's good, it's right. So if I were to ask you if you believe them, you would probably say, yes, of course, I believe the Bible, and that's good. But would, do you really believe these verses we just read? I mean, really believe them. I know, like, often when someone reads a passage out loud, we can hear it, and sometimes the words just kind of pass over and We may catch a few things here and there. This is one of those passages, it's good to slow down. It's good to pay attention, to take a step back and to ask the real question, do I really believe this? Because these are some startling claims that Jesus makes about himself here. Do I really affirm these words to be true and not just true, but profoundly true? If we do believe these words of Jesus, our lives would look vastly different than the lives of the rest of the world in which we inhabit. There is a difference between verbal affirmation and mental assent to a deep-seated trust and conviction in the word. Some of you may have heard of Charles Blondin. Charles Blondin was known as the daredevil of Niagara Falls. He would walk across Niagara Falls on a stretched-out tightrope to the cheers of people watching him all the time. And he started upping the ante, if you will, over and over again. He would blindfold himself and walk across the tightrope with the falls rushing behind him. He would tie his hands behind his back with his pole stretched through his elbows, walking across the tightrope. And then he made a specially designed bicycle to go on the tightrope, and he would ride his bicycle across the tightrope. And then one time he showed up with a specially designed wheelbarrow and he started pushing this wheelbarrow across the falls on the tightrope and he would put things in the wheelbarrow and increase the weight of the things inside the wheelbarrow until finally one time Charles said, does anybody here believe I can push a full-grown man across the falls? And everyone cheered and raised their hands and he said, who's the first volunteer? And everybody put their hands down. (laughs) Nobody wanted to hop into the wheelbarrow. You see, there's a big difference between giving verbal assent, I believe it's true, and trusting your life to that fact. Do we believe these words of Jesus? I would contend today that if we really do put our trust in these words of Jesus, it will absolutely, completely transform the way we live our lives. Again, in this passage, Jesus is claiming some divine prerogatives that can only be attributed to God himself. And if he is, in fact, telling the truth, then it changes everything. Three things in particular that Jesus claims for himself that only God can do. Follow along on your outline as I go through these. The first one is this. Number one, Jesus claims he can bring a rebirth by his awakening. Jesus claims the divine capacity to bring a rebirth by his own awakening. Look again at verse 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here 
when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. You've probably heard teachers or preachers refer to this uh, concept here, this kind of paradox that exists even within this verse, the already and the not yet. Have you heard of that, that phrase before? The already and the not yet. There are some things that already we possess as believers in Jesus, but they have not yet experienced their full fulfillment. For instance, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, that I am already seated with Christ in the heavenly places. How about you? I'm already there, but it's not yet been fully realized. So this is kind of a tension that exists in some of the promises of the Bible. There's an already and a not yet aspect of them. This is one of those truths that Jesus gives here. He, he has an already promise, but a not yet future fulfillment. Look again at verse 25. He begins with the phrase, truly, truly. Now, that is a emphatic. This is a non-negotiable declaration of Jesus Christ. And he says, an hour is coming. That's the not yet. And is now here. That's the already. See that? An hour is coming. That's the not yet fulfillment and is here. That's the now reality already that when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So what does this mean? What does this mean? Well, we saw four individuals profess their faith in Jesus through baptism just a moment ago. They were professing their faith and their belief and their trust in the already. They have passed from death to life. They have gone from darkness to light. They are now children of God, seated with Christ in the heavenly places. That's the already. But there's also a not yet. There's a future fulfillment to be expected. Now, I want you to understand Jesus' statement here, particularly within the timeline and the chronology of his ministry, his work, his day-to-day -day life with his disciples there, in Galilee, and all Judea. Think about what he's saying here that is the already promise. He already says he has the right to give life to those who are dead. This is before the cross. This is before the resurrection. This is before the ascension to sit at the right hand of the Father to reign on high until he comes again. This is before the sending of the Holy Spirit, which happened on the day of Pentecost. Before any of those things happened chronologically in the timeline of Jesus' life and ministry, he says, already, I give life to people. That is profound. What this means is that Jesus is giving this spiritual resurrection. He's already been doing that. Let me rehearse some things that we've studied in the Gospel of John. Back in John chapter 1. Verses 12 and 13, this is what the Bible says, but to all who did receive him, present tense, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man, but they were born of God. This is supernatural. This is transformative. And before the cross, before the resurrection, before the sending of the Spirit, Jesus is already breathing and speaking and giving new life to people. It's fantastic. You go to John chapter 3, where Jesus is having his conversation with Nicodemus. We affectionately call him Nick at night. And at the conclusion of John chapter 3, what does the Bible say? The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has, present tense, eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You turn the page to chapter 4, his discussion with the shady lady from Sychar, the woman at the well. What does, she, what does he say to this woman in adulterous relationships? He says this in John 4, 14, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal what? Life. Jesus is life. And Jesus was giving life by his word. Now, here's what I want to point out. Within the timeline of Christ's work, he's already has the prerogative and the power of God to give life to dead people. Well, what is this death that he's talking about? It's not physical death. It's spiritual death. You can imagine, if you will, when Jesus shows up, he inaugurates his ministry, 
in the spiritual realm, he is walking along a planet filled with cadavers. All of them dead. And one by one, Jesus speaks into their life and they're raised to new life. This is the power of Christ. This dead is what Paul referred to in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. But you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And just a word, just a word brings spiritual life. If that's not evidence of deity, I don't know what is. There's not a single one of us who were born into this planet, who were born spiritually alive. You see, all of us, our default condition is death. I don't care what the pop psychologists say. You are not basically a good person. You are basically a bad person. You're spiritually dead. And dead people can't do anything to save themselves. Dead are dead. And once we come around this reality of our spiritual death in our humanness, then friends, it makes the miracle of life all the more precious. Just a few more passages right here from John that demonstrate that he's giving life to people. Look at John 10, 10, very familiar. The thief, Jesus says, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. In the same chapter, verses 27 and 28, I, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And then the theme verse for the entire Gospel of John, at the end of the book, John tells us, this is why I wrote this book. This is why you have it in your hands. This is why you're reading it. Look at John chapter 20, verse 31. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that's deity, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Friends, nothing is more essential in our human existence than to have the life that can only come from Jesus. This is not about a man teaching morals or ethics or religious ideologies. Jesus' coming was not just about him coming to demonstrate what sacrificial love looks like, even though those things are true. Jesus came to give life to dead people. Now, let's return to our focal passage here in John 5, 25. I'm going to read it again, and I want you to look for what is the prerequisite, what is necessary for receiving this life. Look at it again, verse 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here, already not yet, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. What's the requisite condition for this life on your part? To hear, that's it. You gotta hear. Now, hearing the voice of the Son of God, it's not just hearing information. It's a type of hearing that brings transformation. With this world full of corpses, there is only a single solitary voice that can bring life. And obviously, this again is not just a general hearing. It's an effectual hearing that he accomplishes in our heart. And this is part of the work that we saw when we studied John chapter 3. Unless one is born of the Spirit, he will not see the kingdom of God. It's that supernatural, divine work of conversion that's only attributed to his power. It's God reaching down and speaking with a voice in such a way that the heart hears and responds with faith and repentance. From the voice of Jesus, new life pours into the soul. This is not a superficial hearing. Again, we celebrated baptism today, right? After all, we are a Baptist church. We think baptism is kind of important, right? But as we look at baptism, we see it as the first step of Christian obedience. Someone claims to be a, a follower of Jesus, and Jesus' first command is go and be baptized, then we ought to obey his commands. If someone professes to be a Christian and they say, but I'm not going to be baptized, it would be my assessment, they're probably not a Christian. It's the first step of being an obedient follower of Christ. We follow him and we obey him. But don't miss this, friend. Baptism does not save you. 
It cannot save you. It's, it's not we do some religious ritual and then up, oh, you're on the list. We go through some religious ceremony or some act. These people that Jesus is bringing from death to life, there was no religious act they did. He spoke and they lived. And this is not just an auditory hearing. It's not even just an intellectual comprehension of the sound waves that are hitting your ears. This hearing implies responding by believing, trusting, depending. In fact, look at the previous verse. It was 10 weeks ago when we studied this one. But look at the previous verse in the text, verse 24. Jesus begins that verse with the same two words, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears, there's our word, my word, and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. So this hearing involves a response of believing, of trusting, of depending. And the Bible teaches upon that condition of that hearing, life. Life, immediately, already, not yet. It's not just life in the sweet by and by. It's life, real life in the here and now. This is your present position if you are a believer in Christ. And friends, this is why we believe in the power of the Bible communicating. This is why we have a primacy in our worship services on preaching the Bible. It's not because of the power of the voice of a preacher. I am but dust. It's because in some miraculous way, Jesus speaks to hearts in the preaching moment. I can't manipulate that. I can't cause that. It may happen in someone's life this morning as we talk about Jesus and you hear in a way you've never heard before. You hear the truth in a way you've never heard before. You may have been here for months, maybe even years, week after week, sermon after sermon, words, talks, messages, Bible studies, lessons. But when that happens, you hear like you've never heard before. And you could come to me and say, man, your preaching has gotten a lot better. (laughs) No, you had a dead heart that's now alive. (laughs) You're hearing like you've never heard before. So some application. Let's bring that wheelbarrow up on the tightrope over Niagara Falls. What would it mean (laughs) to sit down in this wheelbarrow of truth with complete trust and dependence Jesus has awakened me from death to life. How would your life change if you really believe this truth? I know one thing in particular. You would have a boldness and a confidence like you've never had before. I know one thing in particular. You would not be concerned about what men can do to you. After all, what's the worst they can do? Kill me? Yeah. (laughs) The statistics are the same. 100%. We're all dying, right? That's not going to change. But you can approach the prospects of even death with confidence and full assurance. Why? Because Jesus has awakened me from death to life. Trust in that truth. This is the first proof of deity Jesus gives after the Jews were whispering and shouting murderous threats against him. Guess what? As the Son of God, I have the power to awaken people from death to life. Here's the second evidence of his deity, the second proof he will give. There will be, there is coming a reckoning before his authority. There is coming a day when there will be a universal reckoning before the authority of Jesus. Notice again verse 27. And he, God the Father, has given him, God the Son, authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Now, this is a reiteration of what Jesus already claimed up in verse 22 that we studied 10 weeks ago, but we've all slept since then, so let's be reminded. Here's what Jesus said up in verse 22 of chapter 5. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. I told you then, and it bears repeating, when we stand before the judgment seat, When we enter the great courtroom of eternity, 
the judge behind the bench, the one with the gavel in his hand, the one before whom all will give account, will not be God the Father. For the Father judges no one. It will be Jesus, God the Son, will be executing judgment upon all humanity. And the nail scars in his hands and his feet and where the thorns pressed into his brow will be visible to all. You will stand before Jesus and give account. Why? Because God the Father has given him, Jesus, authority to execute judgment. And back to our focal passage, verse 27, why will he be the judge? Jesus gives the reason why. Look at the end of verse 27. Because he is the Son of Man. Now, on a first read of that phrase, Son of Man, it may seem that he's using that title to refer to his humanity. In verse 25, he called himself the Son of God, which is a clear reference to his deity. So perhaps the title Son of Man is a reference to his humanity. And it is true. Jesus was and Jesus is fully God and fully man. But this title, Son of Man, which just so happens to be the most popular title that Jesus used about himself, he called himself Son of Man more than anything else. This title, Son of Man, is also an evidence of his deity, that he is, in fact, God. When we studied John 3, we considered this cross-reference, but I think it bears looking at again as he talked with Nicodemus. Look at verse uh, 13 and 14 of Daniel chapter 7. This is where Jesus grabs that title, Son of Man, from. Daniel 7, beginning of verse 13. The Bible says, I saw, this is Old Testament prophecy, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, that's God the Father, and was presented before him. Verse 14, and to him was given, to the Son of Man, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So here, even in Daniel chapter 7, in the Old Testament, some 700 years before Jesus Christ was ever incarnated, there are hints and intimations of the triune nature of God. Here we see there is one, the Ancient of Days, God the Father, and one who is presented to him as the Son of Man, who has the same capacities, the same prerogatives, the same characteristics as God. Dominion, glory, a kingdom, people who serve and who worship him. This is deity. He is not the Ancient of Days. He is another person. And Jesus, in the Gospel of John and throughout the four Gospels, we find he takes this title, Son of Man, and he says, he's here. I am the Son of Man who was promised and predicted by the prophets of old. He is the Son of Man. He is the very one who Daniel saw in the night visions. Jesus has been given all judgment. He's been given all authority. And friends, it is total authority. It is not weak authority. It is not borrowed authority. It is total authority. This week, many of our students, most of our students, are going back to school. And the students let out a collective groan. Oh. And the parents let out a collective sigh of relief. Yes, finally, they're, get them out of my house. School is starting back. And from time to time, our children's teacher will be sick or have a family emergency or need to be out of town, and they won't be in the classroom that day. And on those days, the administration has to find what? A substitute teacher. This is someone with weak authority. <laughs> it's amazing how young children are when they recognize the difference in authority between their regular teacher and a substitute teacher. It's not the substitute's fault. It's the nasty devilish children's fault. <laughs> they have a bent to question authority. Jesus is not a substitute God. Jesus is not a stand-in God. He is the real God, and he possesses all authority, all power, all judgment has been given to the Son of Man. Now, in many of our small groups, we've been studying this book called Gentle and Lowly. And this may sound to you like, well, this is a little different than what we've studied over these chapters in that book. And it is true, as Jesus said in Matthew, 
Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. That is a true representation of Jesus. But friends, we cannot offset the nature of Jesus as the precious lamb of God and the aspect of his nature as the lion of the tribe of Judah. These are his diverse excellencies. And on that day, when we stand before him, when Jesus enters the courtroom of eternity, it will not be, hey guys, look at, there's Jesus, he came in. High five, Jesus. When Jesus enters that courtroom, it will not be, all rise, the judge is here. Nobody will have to say anything, but when we see him, we will fall on our faces like dead men. The glory of Jesus will be unmistakable. His power, his majesty, every knee will bow. This same John who wrote the Gospel of John, who described his love relationship with his best friend Jesus as he leaned up against him as they dined together, his close friend with that intimacy of friendship, he sees the exalted Jesus in the book of Revelation. This very same John. And notice how John responded to seeing Jesus again. In Revelation chapter 1, John writes, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, there he is, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were like white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. The feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. Not just one Niagara Falls, thousands of Niagara Falls is the voice of Jesus. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the shining in full strength. And And did John say, come here, Jesus, let me give you a hug. What did John say? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. If you learn anything today, learn this. Jesus is not someone to be trifled with. He is the God of eternity. He is the Lord of the universe. And he is the one to whom you will give account on that day. And he's been given the right to give account because he is the Son of Man. And he has the right to judge because as the Son of Man, it is true in both senses of that title. Yes, he is the Son of Man and that he is the apocalyptic Son as provided in, in Daniel chapter 7. But he is the Son of Man and that he is the Son of Humanity. He's human. He walked this earth just like you. He was tempted in every way that you have been tempted He was ridiculed, he was abandoned, he was mocked, he was beaten, he was executed as a common criminal bearing our sin debt to the grave, and he was resurrected on the third day to give new life to sinners like us. And so mark my words, on that day there will be no words of derision or scorn before the judge. What gives you the right to judge me, Jesus? (laughs) Those words won't be spoken. In both senses, we will see that Jesus has the right and the authority. It will be clear and obvious to everyone there that he is the God of eternity and the Lord of humanity. And to those who have rejected his gracious call, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. It is easy and my burden is light. I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Learn of me. All who have rejected that kind invitation will on that day be in deep anguish and regret because they have spurned the gospel. If we believe what Jesus says about himself in John chapter 5, verse 27, that he has been given all authority, that he will be the judge of all humanity, Again, we will not trifle with the Lord. But what would it look like if we really believed, if we got in the wheelbarrow of this truth? Look at the wheelbarrow again. What would it mean if we believe that Jesus is the judge of all and has purchased your salvation through his vicarious death? What would that look like for you? 
How would that look in the way you approach life? When you go to work tomorrow, how would that change in the way you approach Jesus? So Jesus presents these proofs to the religious leaders, perhaps a gathering officially of the Sanhedrin. And first he says, I'm God because I have the power to quicken people from death to life simply by my word. I'm God because I am the one who will judge all of humanity. But that leads to the third proof of his deity. Jesus claims to be God because he will bring, number three, a resurrection from his announcement. And I'm altogether certain that the Jewish leaders to whom Jesus was speaking were already thoroughly outraged at his claims. But in the words of Bachman Turner Overdrive, but baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. Look at verse 28 and 29 again. Do not marvel at this. <laughs> Here's the third one. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. This claim would have absolutely incensed and astounded them. Jesus is actually claiming, get this, that he's going to speak a word and every dead person who's ever lived, whatever the decaying, decomposing parts of their flesh remain, whatever little molecules are down in the bottom of the sunken submarine from the Navy in 1942, or to the people who've been buried in the local cemetery, those who have been cremated and their ashes have been spread out in the, in the lawn, all the people who ever have died, all people at that voice will be resurrected from the dead. Do we really believe that? This is outlandish, Jesus. This is crazy. We believe it. First, notice the difference in the timing Jesus gives between the spiritual rebirth of verse 25 and the physical resurrection of verse 28 and 29. In verse 25, he says, an hour is coming and now is, already not yet. But in verse 28 and 29, he says, simply, an hour is coming. This is completely eschatological. It's in the future. It hasn't happened yet. There has not been a global resurrection. We would have probably noticed. There will be, in the future, at the voice of Jesus, a global resurrection of all dead people. There are three states, and just I could spend a whole sermon on these two verses, but let me just quickly give you a little brief synopsis. There are three states of human existence. The existence you have right now. I think all of us in here are alive physically. Good. We're all alive. You are a human soul. You have a human body, a physical body. Our bodies are wearing out. Amen? They're getting worse and worse by the day. And there's coming a day when all of us will die and will be buried. What happens at the moment of death? For both the Christian and the non-Christian, the believer and the unbeliever, what happens? At that instant, you are a soul. Your soul is separated from your body, and you have a conscious existence. There is no soul sleep. There is no annihilation for the bad people. There is no reincarnation to some other physical life form on this planet. That's all hoppycock or poppycock, however you say it. It's not true. At the moment of your death, your soul separates from your body, and you have a conscious existence. You're a bodiless soul. For the believer, you are in the presence of Jesus. Absent from the body, this tent is dead, present with the Lord. For the unbeliever, conscious, aware, in torment, in Hades, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a temporary, it's called the intermediate state. And so right now, your loved ones, they're bodiless souls, your family members, your friends who have gone on before us, whether they were Christian or not Christian, they are currently bodiless souls. They don't have a physical body, but they are consciously awake and aware, either in the presence of Jesus or in the torment of Hades. But there is coming a future cataclysmic event. The universe, which was created by the word of God, will from the very word of the Son of God Everybody will resurrect and will receive a new body. All, Jesus says, 
all who are in their tombs will, will hear his voice. And in that s- s- instance, these bodiless souls will receive new resurrected bodies, bodies that are fit and designed to last forever. For the righteous, we will receive new bodies and we will have a physical existence. That's when we'll see the streets of gold as bodiless souls, but then we're going to be able to walk the streets of gold. As bodiless souls in the intermediate state, we'll see Jesus preparing the great banquet table for the wedding feast of the Lamb, but then when we get the resurrection bodies, we're going to eat. We will have a physical existence for all of eternity. So will the unrighteous. They will receive new bodies that will never wear out, and they will experience physically the torments of the flames of hell forever. Where Jesus says their worm does not die. The little bitty tiny worm in hell, if there is worms in hell, they're not going to be consumed by the flames of fire. Forever. In torment and in pain. This is the final judgment. Sobering truths. And because this is true, it is no exaggeration this morning, friends, to say that right at this moment, listen to me, eternity hangs in the balance. Right now, eternity hangs in the balance. The eternal destiny of every voice, of every person who hears these truths hangs in the balance. So as I close, let's consider this wheelbarrow over the destructive power of Niagara Falls. Let's consider this truth. What would it look like to really believe, to get inside the wheelbarrow? And according to verse 30 of our passage, Jesus will resurrect all people, some to life and some to judgment. What would it look like if you really believed that? What would it look like if you really trusted that truth? For some of you right now, listen, today is the day of salvation. Make your calling and election sure. Do you believe in Jesus? Are you prepared to see the judge? Have you trusted in his atoning work on the cross to take in his own physical body the punishment for your sin? Do you believe in his resurrection to new life and that because he is alive now, seated at the right hand of the Father, coming again to resurrect the the unrighteous and the righteous, that he can give you new life by his word, by his voice? Those who are believers, who know you're a Christian, I would ask, are you living for what lasts? There are so many paltry things that grab our attention and our affection, aren't there? We are so easily distracted, especially in our age of 2022. Squirrel! We can be distracted from the things that really matter. We must live as those who will one day stand before the judge, fall before the judge, and give an account. That leads to my last thought. Do you hear his voice? Listen and live. Let's go to him in prayer.